The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Will our secretary please call roll? Senator Flores? Present. Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Gogachia? Here. Chair Pazina? Present. Senator Scheibel? Here. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have five members present, so we do have a quorum. Before we can begin presentations today, I'd like to provide a, some general housekeeping reminders for those of you that have not attended committee meetings with us in the past, which I would guess would be no one in this room. Please be sure to mute laptops and turn off cell phones. Otherwise, the vice chair will answer it. The public is advised that during meetings, legislators and staff are using laptops to view bills and exhibits, not for personal reasons. We're trying to be as paper-free as possible, so please do not think this is a sign of inattention or disrespect. Please note that we'll be requiring everyone to submit exhibits in an electronic format the day before the meeting, and thank you so much to our presenters today for doing so. A few reminders about testifying before the committee. Please sign in at the table by the door. Give the committee secretary your business card, if you have one, prior to testifying. Even if you're not testifying, you may want to sign in so that there's a record of who's interested in a particular <laughs> bill in case the committee needs to contact you at a later date. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state and spell your name and share your affiliation, if any, for the record. Then turn the microphone off each time that you've completed speaking. If you have handouts for the committee, We've asked that you provide 10 hard copies to the committee secretary for use by the public. We will be taking public comment at the end of each meeting. We'll be limiting public comment to two minutes per person to ensure that everyone gets a chance to speak. Please feel free to provide any additional comments in writing to the committee secretary so that they may be added to the record. First off, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Valentine's Day. We're also celebrating today a very special occasion, Nevada Tribes Day in the legislature. And yesterday was Tourism Day in the legislature. And we're honoring both of these events by two presentations we'll be sharing today. One from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony and another from Travel Nevada, where I had the opportunity to serve on the Commission on Tourism before taking my seat in the legislature. Our first presentation today is going to be from the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. We'd like to welcome Chairman Melendez, Please come forward, press the mic button, identify yourself for the record, and proceed with your presentation when ready. We're really looking forward to hearing from you, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hama. Uh, my name is Arlen Melendez. I'm tribal chairman of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. We're Washoe, Paiute, and Shoshone members. Uh, located in Reno, Nevada, and also 18 miles uh, north of uh, Sparks and Hungry Valley. We have approximately 1,300 tribal members that live uh, on and off the reservation, and I'm being assisted today by Bethany Sam. Uh, she's our uh, public relations uh, officer, and she'll be uh, helping with the PowerPoint that we have. And so uh, we'll start that.
Okay, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, they're having some technical problems, but uh, first of all, uh, Madam Chair, um, we want to um, first uh, uh, thank you for listening to us, uh, for this presentation. We've been here all day, and we've been greeted really warmly by all of the legislators, and we did this presentation uh, earlier today also to a different committee, but I just wanted to uh, just uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the Native American tribes in the state of Nevada, and also a little bit about Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Uh, we're one of um, 28 tribes in the state of Nevada, uh, all the way from uh, McDermott in northern Nevada, all the way down to Mojave and uh, Las Vegas Paiute tribe in the south, and Moapa. Uh, we've uh, been a federally recognized tribe since 1935 under the Indian Reorganization Act. Uh, the Reno Sparks Indian Colony started out in Reno, Nevada uh, as homeless Nevada Indians. And our tribe was basically uh, 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 established by tribes that were in Reno for jobs. And they came from Pyramid Lake Indian Reservation, 30 miles to the north, northeast, uh, and from Washoe Tribe, and that's why we have uh, all the tribes within our tribe, because it was in uh, 1917, we, uh, the federal government, Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, uh, purchased a farm actually in Reno. That's what our reservation was, 20 acres, and then we added another acre, uh, eight acres, in I believe it's 1928. So that was the start of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. Uh, since then, we've added some lands out in Hungry Valley, which are 18 miles north. Uh, near Spanish Springs, uh, just to the, uh, it'd be to the west. And so now we have a total of uh, 15,000 acres. 13,000 acres were added uh, in uh, uh, t uh, 2016. Uh, and so we, uh, we have a lot more uh, acreage to manage. We've been working uh, most of that with BLM land, and so we've worked with the transition from the Bureau of Land Management to manage it ourselves. So. It's a challenge with uh, patrolling that acreage, and uh, just like the BLM had that same uh, challenge of a shortage of officers. And, and so um, uh, we've been uh, here for you know, thousands of years, the Paiutes. Uh, uh, we've, um, uh, as you know, in the history of this uh, nation, uh, I think it was in 19, uh, it was in the 1830s when Justice Marshall defined who we are as when we talk about tribal sovereignty, he defined us as dependent uh, sovereign nations within the United States, that we weren't really uh, independent, we were dependent on the U.S. government really. And then uh, the challenge is that uh, nobody wants to be dependent, uh, tribes want to be independent, and some of the laws that have been passed by the United States make us more dependent. When they put us on reservations, that made us more dependent on the federal government and basically were controlled by, we couldn't hunt anymore in our aboriginal, aboriginal territory, so we had to rely on the federal government uh, basically providing foodstuffs for tribes. So that was a dependency that was established in uh, laws such as the Allotment Act of, I believe in the, of, in the 1880s that basically uh, took away a lot of reservation land, and uh, basically many of it was sold off. And so we lost a lot of land uh, during those years when they dismantled reservations. We've been through the termination era of the 1950s where we basically, uh, some tribes were dismantled. Uh, they were basically, uh, they weren't tribes anymore. They were taken off uh, their status as Indian tribes, the Klamath tribes, uh, Menominee tribe in Wisconsin. There was about five tribes until it kind of stopped. And they've been restored since then, but that was a bad policy. Um, we also have been through assimilation, you know, um, where our language was prohibited. And uh, we also ended up in the boarding school era that uh, we lost a lot of uh, our uh, dances and our languages and our cultural identity. So since that, those early years, we've been trying to build that back up, and I think that's what uh, everything is about right now. And um, as you know, uh, uh, we are working, uh, building relations back with the state of Nevada. Uh, we have a good relationship over the years. Uh, 
Most tribes have been in poverty when you really look at uh, tribes across the United States. Indian gaming came on under the Indian Regulatory Act, which helped some of the tribes, but not all of the tribes, especially here in the state of Nevada, where it's too competitive to really compete in gaming. Uh, we came to the legislature in, in 1991, I believe, passed a taxation agreement with the state of Nevada that basically was codified in the state law in 1991, and that allowed us to collect taxes equal to or greater than the state that basically took away the unlevel playing field, meaning that if tribes didn't collect a tax at all, we'd be able to sell lower than competitors. So the state was satisfied that we were taxing at the same level, the tribes could keep the tax, and we could build some type of economy since we couldn't uh, get into gaming. And so that's what Reno Sparks has done over the years. Uh, we've purchased land and we've uh, basically uh, established tribal businesses on those lands. Some are owned by tribes. Uh, as you can see, this picture up here just gives some of the aboriginal territory of the, of the northern Paiute, western Shoshone, uh, the western Shoshone to the east, the northern Paiute, and the Washoe tribe is a little to the south. Uh, this is Washoe land where we are right now, you know, so Lake Tahoe, also Washoe land. They also go uh, uh, north towards uh, uh, Reno up that way. And so uh, we kind of share a crossing of tribes in some territories. And so uh, uh, then we got the southern tribes down south uh, that are, uh, so there's 28 tribes and uh, we all come together in the Intertribal Council of Nevada, which just had a meeting yesterday uh, at the Intertribal Council, which is located in downtown Reno, talking about issues. And, um, and so we meet quarterly on that, so it's a good way uh, to stay. And we met with, uh, we've had a good relationship meeting with the governor. Uh, we hope to meet with the new governor um, sometime uh, in the near future, as we did with uh, Governor Sislak. So uh, all the governors, uh, have uh, met with the tribes in that government to government relationship. So we hope we establish a good relationship with the legislature and the governor and address some of the issues. Um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the issues on the boarding schools, uh, as you saw, we've been supporting the restoration of the Stewart Indian School, which was in some legislation that uh, has uh, 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 reestablish some of the buildings out at the Stewart Indian School. Uh, so that's a good thing. We also have the cultural center out there that is a, a good place that uh, really brings a tribe. My parents actually went to Stewart Indian School, met there actually, and were married in that school a long time ago. So it's a, it's a, it holds a, a deep place in our heart uh, as far as that school. And then you can see uh, just a little bit of a history of our, our uh, tribes as far as purchasing land and uh, we became a, a, a government in under the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934 and that allowed us to develop constitutions and our tribal councils started meeting at that time as formal uh, governments. And then we uh, basically uh, acquired Hungry Valley like it says there. Uh, we have a nine-member tribal council that meets uh, once a month, and we've uh, addressed issues. Uh, one of the things uh, we've done is um, uh, uh, established uh, businesses on uh, reservation lands. As I told you, uh, uh, we built uh, also a health center in uh, Reno uh, based on uh, tax-exempt bonds that really were uh, backed by uh, taxation dollars. We also have uh, pictures of some of our, uh, what housing was like in the 1950s, and it was, was uh, really a, a time of poverty back in those days. We also, uh, another picture where we didn't have any roads. We had, well, we had roads, but they weren't paved. They were basically gravel roads. We had outhouses back in those days, too, irrigation ditches around the Reno Sparks and then Colony. We had a lot of businesses that were undesirable. We had uh, gravel pits right near our backyards, construction companies, and those uh, are now where the Grand Sierra is, downtown Reno, where some of those gravel pits were. 
And so uh, that's a little bit of history. This is uh, under the HUD. We started to uh, develop housing under housing urban development. These are some of the houses on Reno Sparks Indian Colony. You can see there's streets that are paved. And this was in, the, I believe, the 60s and 70s. We started to get HUD housing. And right now, HUD housing has been diminished with federal cutbacks. So they're, they're not uh, building as many houses as they did uh, back in those days. So it might be, you're very uh, fortunate. It's a very competitive process now where you're competing against uh, 576 tribes in the nation. So there's a few times we didn't get funded at all. So we're looking at innovative ways to build housing now, whether it's using tax bonds or something like that. And so uh, we have a housing project right now. We're kind of trying to uh, build out in Hungry Valley a 25, uh, 25 more houses out there. And uh, this is our health center. We built, as you know, health is an uh, important issue to all of the tribes. We actually are leading in many of the uh, diabetes and some of the diseases. You know, Native Americans are you know, not very healthy over the years, the change in diets and all those different things. We're trying to get back to eating healthier, you know, back to traditional foods, but this health center's needed. We built it, uh, we constructed it. It was a 60,000 uh, square foot uh, building. We had to purchase the land. We used it with a tax base to uh, do tax exempt bonds. It was a $16 million project. We service not just our 1,300 members, but we also service the urban Indian population, which is about 8,000 members in Washoe County, you know, and that's, uh, so we service not, uh, every uh, four people that come in our health center, one is a tribal member and three are, are non-tribal uh, members, but they're Native American. So there's Navajos, Sioux, uh, all kind of different. And as you know, 50% uh, or more of Native Americans live in the cities rather than on reservations. And so uh, whether it's in Phoenix, Los Angeles, or Chicago, or even Reno or Las Vegas, you know, uh, half of them at, live on in the cities. So, so we have to service those people with health uh, service. Yeah, and our patient base is about 8,000 uh, uh, users of the health center. Uh, Medicaid is really important to us because uh, the federal government only funds a certain amount of money and it's usually not enough. And so the Medicaid uh, reimbursements are real important to the tribes and so Nevada being a me Medicaid state is real important to all of the health centers and for most of the tribes and trying to generate third party revenue to try to service more people. And so it alleviates, and that's a win-win situation because it alleviates, if we didn't have this health center, then all these Native Americans would be going to renown, you know, or urgent care and all those different things. So I think it's, uh, it really helps in when we can alleviate uh, that burden on some of the local hospitals by having this health center there. Um, we all, this is our tribal council. As you know, we operate the same as cities and counties. We have all of the, uh, the uh, responsibilities. We have a tribal court. We have police officers. Uh, we fund uh, probably about 15 police officers for both Hungry Valley and the downtown colony. We have to co cover commercial properties too, like Walmart, which is located on the reservation. And there's, uh, you wouldn't be surprised at the crime in places like Walmart with shoplifting and all those different things. So it, it's really a challenge that we never foresaw, but it requires more uh, police officers and they're spread out going all the way to Hungry Valley and back to downtown Reno. Uh, we have social services, education, public works, planning department. We have a tribal historic uh, preservation officer, environmental departments, housing, and we employ about 345 uh, uh, people, uh, but half of those are non-tribal, so we employ just a general population uh, that are need jobs. So we do add to uh, that, uh, you know, uh, alleviate the unemployment. Um, these are some of the businesses that are located on the Reno Sparks Colony. In the bottom is uh, some of our smoke shops. As you know, tribes started out in smoke shops all the way from Walker River in the early 1980s. and um, 
that was the only business that was viable to most reservations. Just about every reservation has one. And so we have some of those businesses. It's a declining market though, you know, because of health issues. So it, so it, all it do, does is give us, uh, when we open another smoke shop, you're really making the same amount of money, but, but all we're doing is diversifying in a declining market. So that's why we've diversified in attracting other businesses like Mercedes and uh, the tribal land. And so those are a part of the diversification from uh, the tobacco business. So even though it's declining, we're trying to bring other businesses on. And so um, uh, those are just some of the businesses we've uh, worked on. So the, the tax agreement works really well. We also contribute uh, 500,000 uh, 500, to the Washoe County School District that we agreed to in a, in a support by the legislature back when we uh, basically uh, was approved for Walmart coming to the reservation. And that was a little bit controversial, but we felt that we're part of the community. So we fund that 500,000 every year to Washoe County School District since our children go to school in public schools. So uh, that kind of helps out the, at that time, there were shortages of teachers and just about everything there. And we worked real close with the Washoe County School District. And also we try to get involved with community relationships. Uh, you know, we're involved with our town uh, all kind of uh, civic organizations. We try to uh, uh, become involved with the city, uh, just about, our, we try to share our culture. So our dancers, they do a lot of events at many of the public uh, uh, events. We have color guards that are Native American that are invited to do a lot of, uh, you know, the color guards in parades or even at some of the events at the hotels. So we have, uh, that's one way to kind of, uh, depict our, our rich culture that we have. And then, uh, and then finally we have uh, uh, just some of the federal agencies we work with, uh, Washoe County Commissioners, the City of Reno, City of Sparks, the federal agencies, you can see some of them there. Uh, because the, you know, everybody changes, you know, we, we had to go to the city council. I just went and met with uh, three new members just last week, you know, because uh, they, they basically, some didn't get reelected or whatever. And the same with Washoe County. I have to go there and met with a couple of new uh, Washoe County commissioners. So it never ends, you know, just uh, building relationships all over again with different people. So that's, uh, that's important. Uh, it's a foundation of why we kind of uh, are successful in economic development because building relationships, I think, is so important in doing that. And then uh, finally, this is just some of the land around Reno Sparks. You can see we were involved heavily with the uh, the freeway uh, uh, expansion, as you can see up there where it crosses the river up the top. Uh, working with the uh, NDOT and uh, you know, the, the people that were constructing the freeway, we depicted, uh, they work with us, so we have Native American design on the freeway there. We have a, a lot of uh, dancers, uh, 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 some of the uh, animals that are, uh, that are culturally relevant to the tribes. You know, you can see that right uh, at, the, uh, at the Grand Sierra, at the intersection of the freeway off-ramp and uh, Second Street or Glendale there. So, if you get a chance, you might take a look at that. It's just a beautiful uh, depiction of Native American art in that uh, freeway design, baskets on the, on the walls of the freeway. And so we worked really good in building that relationship. And as you know, in the early years, when the freeway was first built by, uh, they never even came to the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, so we didn't have any input into when the freeway first was uh, nearly 800 yards from the backyards of the colony. Now they're about, I think they're about uh, eight feet from the back backyard of our a wall. Even though they build a wall there, it's still a lot closer than where it was before. But I think it uh, was a workable situation with on the Spaghetti Bowl Express that we just completed there. And then, um, and finally, some, uh, uh, some of the legislature went to visit our Wounded Souls uh, exhibit we work with the university, I think the, the School of Mines, and 
engineering? Yeah, Mackey. Mackey uh, Mayans, and they uh, let us use some of their, uh, you know, the old equipment and different things that are part of that display uh, to depict mining in the early days. And uh, Michonne Eben, our cultural uh, coordinator, has put that together. We've had a, a number of visitors that have come to our cultural center there and uh, looked at that. So we invite you to come and uh, if you haven't been there, I know some of the legislators have, have been there to look at that and it's a, it really uh, t uh, t uh, tells a story about the past, you know. So we are trying to work with the mining industry. We're not opposed to mining, you know, but we have to try to find a proper balance in protecting cultural sites and and water and all those different things that are that are important to the tribe. So sometimes it brings us uh, in uh, maybe uh, to a position where we're, it seems like we're opposing, but I don't think we're opposing, you know, uh, electric cars or anything like that. We're just trying to protect our sacred sites and those type things. And sometimes it maybe it appears that uh, we're trying to uh, oppose mining in general, but that's not what we're trying to do. Uh, so with that, that's uh, just uh, our presentation, and uh, if you have any questions for me, I just want to thank you again for allowing me to just give you a quick synopsis of what we're working on and my tribe, and, and that's, uh, uh, it's good to be here. Thank you so much, Chairman, for being here for Nevada Tribes Day. Are there any questions from the committee? Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Seeing no further questions, we thank you again for your presentation and hope you enjoy the rest of the day here. Next, we'll be receiving a presentation from Travel Nevada, and we'd like to welcome Director Scolari. Please come forward, press the mic button, identify yourself for the record, and proceed with your presentation when ready. Good afternoon. For the record, Brenda Scolari, I'm the... Uh, Director of Tourism and Cultural Affairs for the State of Nevada, uh, here today on behalf of the Division of Tourism or Travel Nevada. At the request of Chair Pazina, I'm going to give you a brief overview of um, tourism's representation of outdoor recreation uh, in our marketing. And I thought the way to start this is to show you our most recent uh, television commercial which tells the story of Nevada's outdoor spaces uh, quite beautifully. Uh oh. Let me try this again. This is Nevada. A landscape carved by dreams. There we go. Determination. If you're ready to hit the road, follow your heart and find a horizon that hits just right. Sound go. We know just the place. Unless it's going through HDMI. Director, would you like for us to call IT? Let's try this. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Good idea. All right, let's let her rip. Okay, let her rip. If you're ready to hit the road, follow your heart and find a horizon that hits just right. We know just the place. Landscape carved by dreams, determination, and a daring sense of adventure. Here, we don't wonder why. We breathlessly ask, what's next? So remember, when the urge to wander strikes, our 
otherworldly frontier awaits. Come give your rugged soul room to roam in our wilder, opener spaces. All right. Well, um, as you can see, we really can't tell the story of Nevada without talking about our beautiful um, outdoor spaces. Just get this going here. All right. There we go. Um, when promoting Nevada, both domestically and internationally, we rely on some key strengths that are part of the marketing messages we promote through print, social, digital and streaming ads, commercial ads, and content media partnerships. Um, those key strengths for us are outdoor experiences, authentic Western culture and events, and entertainment. When we consider the character of travel, the Travel Nevada brand, we use descriptions like stunning, authentic, entertaining, and accessible. The outdoor rec recreation economy played a vital economic and social role throughout the pandemic and remains a source of strength nationally and a booming job creator locally. The U.S. Department of Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis reported an 130% increase in outdoor recreation spending in Nevada in 2021, generating a $4.9 billion contribution to the economy and representing over 50,000 jobs statewide. So given this surge of interest in Nevada's outdoor spaces, Travel Nevada repeats a recreate responsibly message whenever possible to influence the, the behavior of these new visitors. We advocate for staying on established trails and roads, respecting all signs and gates, and minimizing the impact of off-road vehicles. Travel Nevada's public relations efforts focus on content themes with a consistent recreation thread which are tied to marketing campaign thing, themes such as uninhibited spaces, surprising discoveries, and rewarding adventures, all of which have an outdoor recreation payoff. TravelNevada.com's outdoor recreation content is categorized into 12 areas that lead the user to detailed information about how to best experience those activities. For example, Travel Nevada's Dark Skies Finder page launched, launched last spring features an interact, interactive map of Nevada's stargazing locations. With some of the darkest nighttime skies in the country, our stargazing sanctuaries and activities are among the best places for amateurs and professionals to observe and photograph the Milky Way. A look and feel of Travel Nevada's advertising relies on the visual impact of outdoor Nevada. Here you see examples of our print, digital, and out-of-home ads, all of which compel the traveler to explore Nevada's unexpected and memorable landscapes. Nevada Magazine and Visitor's Guide, known for its stunning cover imagery, is full of stories and travel planning resources that educate the reader about our world-class outdoor recreation opportunities. Our 10 branded road trips are curated itineraries that guide visitors and residents along and off our highways to our state parks, Great Basin National Park, and to the bounty of hiking, biking, soaking, climbing, and riding opportunities along the way. Travel Nevada's new destination development grant program will assist Nevada communities in establishing a long-term tourism plan, which will prioritize needed infrastructure often for regional outdoor recreation, that when better managed will mean more revenue and fewer environmental impacts. Our destination development grant application and evaluation, evaluation process involves outdoor recreation agencies, organizations, and land managers, all of whom bring a unique perspective on the role our natural resources play in the long-term economic health of Nevada communities. Appropriate access to local outdoor spaces is a top quality of life indicator and one of the ways to ensure our communities are great places to live and work. Lastly, uh, the Division of Tourism secured a U.S. Department of Commerce EDA competitive award to build two adventure centers in Nevada. 
Adventure centers are facilities dedicated to connecting residents and visitors to the outdoor experiences in the region and our support for the growing outdoor recreation economy. With proposed locations in Boulder City and Carson City, Adventure Centers will serve our cities by providing adventure seekers with safety and conservation best practices and access to vetted local tour guides and outfitters, overcoming the guesswork often involved in finding and, and safely enjoying regional outdoor activities. That concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Director. As she shared, I had asked her to come today, the day after Tourism Day, because I feel like outdoor recreation has been such an important part of tourism here in the state, and something that during the pandemic, I think, it became a lot more apparent was really a driving economic force here, too. Um, are there any questions from the committee? Uh, I will ask the same question we ask in finance, and maybe Senator Hansen knows, but the third slide back, the old mill in that valley, I ask you in finance, too, if you knew where that was. <laughs> I know. Okay. <laughs> Do you? Berlin. That's Berlin. Okay. I couldn't place the slide, so thank you, <laughs> Senator Hansen. Thank you, Senator. We don't have a prize for you, however. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to ask a little bit about these adventure centers, and they've not been established yet, right? No, they have not. Okay. And what would the vetting process be like for companies that want to be a preferred vendor? Uh, thank you for your question. For the record, Brenda Scaleri. I will have to establish an application process, and uh, we're working on a revision of the, the leases. They will be built on state property uh, in Carson City here on our uh, railway, Carson City Railway um, property, and in Boulder City adjacent to the Boulder City Chamber of Commerce, which is on an NDOT parcel. Um, so we'll have to re revise those leases to accommodate um, private businesses and the, uh, their uses on the property. And we'll have to establish a way, um, an applic application and, and qualifications that need to be met. We have not yet done that, though. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? I would encourage the committee as well to check out the rural grant process because there are so many really fascinating proposals turned in by the destination marketing organizations around the state. So if you haven't had a chance, do check that out. Thank you so much, Director. You are welcome. With um, no further questions, thank you for your presentation. Thank you again. Our final business is public comment. As a reminder, public comment is limited to two minutes per person, but please feel free to submit additional written comments to the secretary and they will be added to the record. Is there any public comment here in Carson City? As I see no one rushing forward to make public comment, BPS, is anyone wishing to provide public comment on the phone lines? Thank you, Chair. Your line is open and working, but you have no callers at this time. With no callers, I will take that as a resounding no. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further public comment, that concludes our meeting. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs>